Good afternoon. Welcome to the session. I'm Andrew Collier and I'll be chairing. Uh, this afternoon we have three standard talks followed by two lightning talks and that should take us through to around 6 p.m. So the first uh, talk is by Nathan Daly and he's going to be talking about uh, Julia apps on the App Store. Okay. Do I just start? Okay, hi, I'm Nathan. Um, and uh, thanks for coming to my talk on turning your Julia programs into statically compiled, self-contained Julia desktop applications. Um, so yes, yeah, so I mentioned it earlier, but this is a totally interactive workshop. I'm going to try to cram a workshop into 30 minutes. So do download the Jupyter Notebook and follow along if you can. Or if you don't have Jupyter on your computer, you can download the HTML slides that are here and just um, copy paste into a Julia REPL. And I have the slides at the very bottom in that tiny font down there. So uh, if you want to grab it, it's, see, it's still there. Um, so uh, OK, real quick what we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm just going to start with some definitions, explain what I'm talking about when I say application and compiling. And then we're going to look at a demo. And the rest of this is interactive. We're going to build a command line application together um, that's distributable and portable. Um, and then we're going to try to figure out how we can deal with packages that, we're, that our program uses and all of its binary dependencies. And we're going to make a GUI, a little GUI app. So one more administrative note, if you're following it, uh, clone this cell, run this cell, and you'll get Application Builder, which is the package that we're talking about. And the rest of this, this is for if you're doing it in Julia 7. Um, and uh, here we go, definitions. OK, so what am I talking about when I say application? Um, you may have seen that the new Julia 7 docs have an opinion on what an application is. And basically, an application is any project that isn't a package. So it's a standalone uh, pack. It's a standalone project that is intending to do a thing. Um, it's not. It's not code intended to be reused. So that's like part of what I'm talking about when I talk about an application. Um, but for this talk, I'm going to have a little bit more specific definition as well. Um, so it's a standalone functionality, um, but also it's distributable. Um, and so that means that you can take your application that you've built and send it to someone else, and they can run it. Um, so you can put it on your website, put it on an app store. Um, and following from that, then your application needs to be self-contained. So by this, I mean that um, you, your users don't necessarily need to have ever even heard of Julia in order to run your application. Um, this is a, a standard application that your OS can open, um, whether or not you've heard of Julia. And so finally, um, the last thing is a compiled binary. So this is sort of an optimization. It's not really necessary for, for you to ship an application. But um, it's a nice optimization. If you're sending your code to users and you're done with it, there's no reason for them to be compiling it every time they run it, right? Um, but also, for as we saw in some of these other talks about this, um, maybe your company has proprietary source code. You don't want to be shipping your source. So um, this is a, a thing people want. So here is, here's what I'm talking about. This is an example. Um, this, is, this is a silly little game that I created. Uh, it's an app that's written entirely in Julia. Um, and it's a real application. Like You can get it on the App Store. Um, and you can download it, and you can run it, and it's like, it's it's an application, and I built it entirely in Julia, and it's like, it's goofy, it's just Pong, it's pretty crappy actually, but I made it in Julia, and that's cool, um, and so yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so after this talk, you can do the same thing, um, and so just like a one more note on why Julia is not only great for all the things we already know Julia is great for, but it's also great for software engineering. And uh, this is just me like live editing some code. So I was I put my I put an include statement inside a part of my run loop. So every second it reincluded my file, and I was all of a sudden that was live editing, which was amazing. And um, so I was like, how come it's not like why, uh, collisions are hard? And then like I was able to figure out, oh, it's because of whatever. And so like uh, that 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 was awesome. Um, but even more than that, just like I've, all the games that I've created before this, which is not that many, have been in C++ and Java and these like slow static languages. And just for me, it was so much more fun and easy, obviously, for all the reasons we all know, to work in Julia. Um, but so that's for me. Like, Julia was better than C++ for, for doing this. It was more fun. But, but what about for you? You already use Julia in your day-to-day -day life. Why should you join me in the software engineering world and build an application out of your program? Um, basically, it all boils down to you want to share what you've done. So maybe you have a, a tool that you use all the time in your work as a scientist or whatever, and you just want to like send it to someone because it's useful. But you don't want to have to explain to them how to download Julia and install it, download your source code, install all the packages you need, figure out how to run your source code in Julia with your packages. It, actually, I think Julia is pretty easy to install compared to like most other programming environments, but like still this is a barrier. And so um, breaking that barrier is great. And so that's the example we're going to run through here today. Um, is uh, let's say we have a Julia program that we wrote, and it's called our project because we're creative folks. 
and we want to we want to share it with the world. So um, this rest of this talk is interactive now. It's a Jupyter notebook. I encourage you to follow along so that afterwards you can say that you too have built an application in Julia. Um, but if you don't, it's going to be here on the screen. So in our project, we have a source directory, and our source directory contains all our code, like any good Julia project. And this is our um, entire program. Um, normally, I'd be writing in an IDE or something, right? But this is in a notebook, so it's reproducible. So this cell is just putting these contents into this file so that this is like our project. Um, and so our project is really simple. Um, we pick a random number, 0 to 2 pi, and we plot a, uh, a period of sign. Um, so inside of our project, we now have uh, a single file. And we can run it just like any Julia code. Um, this is the way that you would normally do it. You could also just like run it through the binary. And every time you do it, you get a different random period of, pi of sign. The other thing is we are printing out the current working directory for reasons I will explain in a moment. Uh, but you can see we're right here inside my notebook uh, folder. OK, this is the best application we've ever built. And we need to share it with everyone. So uh, let's do that. Um, this is Application Builder. It's the package that we put together. Uh, Runjan has helped a lot with me um, to uh, build your, to, to turn your Julia code into an application. So um, we are going to use it to compile our program and uh, and bundle it. So one more note on definitions here. When I say compiling, uh, I mean something specific. So um, the best way to explain this is uh, to remember that Julia really is a, I saw this on the internet somewhere, but Julia is a statically compiled language that happens to have this awesome interpreter. It's not an interpreted language that we're going to coerce into compiling, right? So um, the, the normal operation of a Julia program is every time you define a function at the REPL, we're, we're parsing your function, lowering it to AST, and we're saving it there. And then the first time you call it with new types, we compile that function into machine instructions native to your architecture, and we cache it. So we say, the next time you call this function with those types, we just reuse that compiled code, right? Um, there's a bunch of flags that awesome people in this room have added to the Julia binary that uh, if you put those flags in, you can get it to say, hey, don't just cache that in RAM so that next time I run Julia, I have to rebuild that entire cache. Write that cache to disk as an object file. So that's really like what's going on here. Um, and all of this is bundled up in this uh, package called packagecompiler.jl that we heard some other people mention today in previous talks. Um, and uh, it's super awesome. And a lot of that work was done before I was even involved. So thank you to those people here uh, and many more. Um, but yeah, so we create an object file from all of the machine instructions that we've, the machine instructions and the lowered um, AST for uh, all of the code. And we write it to disk as an object file, and then we link it into a shared library, and finally we wrap all that in an executable. So that's what compiling means. Um, and so while we, uh, now that we have an idea of what we're doing, let's just do it. This is the API. It's very similar to actually Elliot's API in the, the previous thing. It's just a single function, build an app bundle. Um, and you give it the file that we're compiling, and uh, it, it, it goes ahead. So it um, starts, because we didn't specify a build directory, it um, just creates a build directory here inside of uh, our current directory. And it creates an empty project.app. And project.app is what's going to be our output um, application. And um, so you can see, just as I promised, Julia is just running your code. Uh, it's running your code. It's parsing it. It's lowering it. It's compiling it. Um, but uh, the thing is, it's kind of weird because uh, all this code was was global. It was just globally defined code in a script, um, and so it gets it gets evaluated as well when Julia uh, when Julia runs on a script. It evaluates any global scope functions, and so normally if it's a function, the evaluation is just the lowering step. But if it's if it's an, if it's a statement like this, it actually gets evaluated. Um, so um, a couple things real quick to note. One is that this is slow. It takes like a minute. Um, another thing to note is that uh, there's a lot of output here. And the last thing to note is that this is about to fail. Um, and it's about to fail for a reason I'm about to tell you. But um, basically, it's because of that structure that we just had all our code uh, at global scope. OK, so we can see here it failed. And um, the complaint it gave us was that there's no Julia main function. When it tried to link everything together, it couldn't find Julia main. So um, to figure out why that's happening and what we need to do to actually build our bundle, one more piece of behind the scenes insight. Um, when you build an application bundle, there's really two things that are happening. First is it creates this empty directory structure for your application bundle. Um, so what I'm calling an application bundle is just like a standard OS application that you can double click and it runs. Um, so to do that, you have to bundle together all the things you need for your application. So you need your executable, which is what we're normally used to creating. Um, but then you also need all the runtime libraries to run your executable. So in the case of like Elliot's previous talk, that is any libraries that your packages depend on. 
but it could also just be like the Julia runtime in our case. So if you were building a C++ application, you would need to have the C++ runtime available, um, but most computers just come with that pre-installed, but they don't come with the Julia runtime pre-installed. So you have to put that into your application bundle that you're gonna put on the App Store or wherever. Um, and then in my video game, like I needed graphics and fonts and stuff. Um, so this is an app, and uh, it's just a directory that has the .app uh, extension. And on Windows, it's just a directory that lives in program files. Um, so the second thing we do is now we have this empty shell of an application, and now we compile the code with the process I discussed earlier. So we build a static shared library, which is the same process as building a Julia sys image, because it, it just is a Julia sys image, that has uh, both all of the Julia standard library, like a normal sys image that Julia ships with, but also it has all of the code that you've compiled and, and, and linked in. Um, and then it also compiles this tiny little driver executable, um, which uh, initializes your load time, loads your code, and then runs it. Um, very similar to the, uh, one of the keynote presentations today in the um, other room. Um, so uh, this driver executable needs some way to find your code so it can call it. Um, and the convention we've chosen is Julia main. So basically, your code has to define this Julia main function. And this is the first piece of your code that's going to get executed when your application is run. So this is exactly the same way that int main works in, in a C program. Um, the, the, the driver is going to load your code and execute Julia main. So what that means is the first thing that, you're, that happens to your ex application is that Julia main is called. And at runtime, any globally scoped uh, statements aren't going to get executed because your program is going to start with Julia main. So to look at an example of what that looks like, um, application builder comes bundled with a bunch of examples. Um, so here's one such example. This is a really simple command line program. It just asks for your name and then greets you. Um, but all of it is wrapped inside of this Julia main method uh, function. And so that's what we're missing. So let's do it. Um, here's the new version of our program. It's exactly the same as before, except for I've, I've put it in Julia main, like I was saying. Um, and the other thing I did is I added a globally executed statement still, so we can compare the difference. So we get an Adele greeting from the outside. And um, let's compile it. So uh, also, uh, sorry, that's, I, had, I had to edit all my good jokes for time. So that's like the only joke you're going to get, and it's a bad one. Um, but yeah, so uh, build that bundle also takes a bunch of options. Um, this is, these are a few of them. Um, we're going to name our output application, so it's not just whatever our source file is. Um, we're going to specify a build directory, so it's not just whatever our current working directory is. And then we have this command line app flag, and this is only necessary on Mac, but basically Apple hides the standard in, standard out from your applications. Um, when you double click a dot app, it doesn't, it doesn't show you what the SCD in and SCD out is. Um, so this is just, it just, this flag just tells your application to include a little terminal that opens up and then runs your code inside of there. Exactly the same thing that the Julia app does on Mac. If you double click the Julia app that you download, it opens a terminal and then runs Julia inside there. Um, and so uh, that's what this flag does. It's not needed on other systems. So here's our hello from the outside statement. Um, indeed, Adele says hi. And uh, that got executed because it's a globally scoped statement, right? But then when it defined the, when it executed the Julia main function, all that does is uh, lower it and um, cache it and then eventually write it out to disk. Um, so um, this, is, this is it. Oh, I, sorry, while that was compiling, I did want to just talk a little bit more about why Julia main looks so weird. Um, and that's basically just because of these two extra things that you don't usually see in Julia programs. Um, this C callable macro, sorry, uh, just prevents name mangling on this function. So it makes sure that the name is actually Julia main in the output. It's the same thing extra in C does in C++. Um, and then this is the status code return from your program, the same as the int in int main. Um, okay, so that's it. We have an application. We built it. And now here we have our, uh, our project directory. And we have this builds folder that we created. And here is hello world. And we can run it multiple times. And every time, we'll get a different, um, different random number. And uh, we could send this to someone. And it, it'll run on any computer, even though they've never heard of Julia, because it has all of the Julia runtime libraries inside that application, which is pretty cool. Um, and the other thing is it prints out this working directory. And notice that it's not our current working directory. And that's because by default, Apple moves your current working directory to your home directory when you run an application, which is super annoying if you want to reference any resources or libraries inside your application. So um, we, have a run, we have some utilities in this package as well that you can use to get back to where you want to be so you can access those things. We'll look at those in a second. But that's it. Um, oh, no, that's right. I added one more thing. This week, I've learned some things. And one of the things that I learned is that I was lying to you earlier, and we weren't really compiling the code. 
um, we were simply uh, lowering it. The same thing that happens when you import a package. All that happens when you execute a function, or um, the first time that you parse and execute a function in, uh, pack in a file is it gets lowered and it only gets compiled the first time you execute that function um, with a certain set of types. And so because in the code that we provided, we never called Julia main, uh, it never actually gets compiled to native. So when you run your code, the, the Julia runtime linked inside your application is actually compiling it again every time just like as if we hadn't, uh, hadn't changed anything. So um, there's this concept called snoop files that Tim Holy came up with. Um, and it's also a part of package compiler. And so basically, um, you, can, you can snoop over your code and tell it uh, what actual functions you actually really, really do want it to compile to native code. Um, and you can put that in a snoop file here. So this would just contain a list of, in, uh, of function calls that you want it to do, and you only have to do that once. Um, or uh, I added this auto snoop flag yesterday that just, it just calls Julia main with an empty array of args. Um, so, it'll, so while you're compiling, it ends up running your whole program, and then you have to kill it, and then let it finish compiling, and then you, know, and then you have an output program, and it's kind of slow, so I'm not demoing it here. But um, if you do that, then you'll have a, a truly compiled, statically compiled, self-contained Julia application. And that's it. So we can ship this application to, to users, put it on the App Store, they can download it. It's real. We're, we're done. We did a thing together. But um, we're really here because we want to see GUI apps. GUIs are cool, and people like them. So. Um, this is a smattering of some of the GUI packages that exist in Julia, totally outside of Application Builder. Um, and just a few of them, there's a bunch. Um, and the ones with green check marks are the ones where I've like, managed to get everything together so that you can use these and, bun and, and create an application and bundle it. Um, so actually, Runjin gave a talk yesterday, hopefully you saw, about um, CircuitScape. And they built that application using Blink for their GUI and Application Builder to, to bundle it. Um, and I made my video game using SDL, but it's really for games, not really for regular UIs. So we're gonna do Blink um, in the rest of this talk. So I'm gonna just sort of scroll through this pretty quickly, but you may have heard of Blink. It's a, a wrapper around Electron, and Electron is basically like a browser that lets you run an HTML file locally so that you can write your UI in HTML. Um, and so Blink is a Julia package that lets you, uh, from Julia, talk to Electron so you can say, here's my HTML, and I want it to come into my Electron window. So this HTML creates a slider and hooks it all up, so when you move the slider, Julia sees the slider's values. So cool, we now know that Julia and Electron can communicate. Um, here's some more things you've probably seen before. This is plots, uh, and we're gonna use a Plotly backend for plots because uh, it's already in JavaScript and it plays nicely with Blink. Um, so this is our program from before. We're picking a random number and we're plotting it, uh, plotting a, a, a period of it. Um, and so what we want is we want to get that on our GUI. So this is just some code to show the plot, P is the plot, to show the plot as HTML, save it to a string buffer, and then put the HTML into our window, and now we have our plot in our window. So we're, we're so close to an application, right? Um, so let's, let's do that. This cell is our entire new program. Um, it's just the same things from before. It uses Blink and plots, it creates a window with a little empty div for our, for our plot, and then every time you change the slider, it runs our program from earlier, takes the HTML, and splats it into the window. So, uh, so we can, here we have a program, and we can like move through, through sign, which is really pretty. Um, yeah, and so that's it. Um, this is the best thing we've ever done, and we just need to, we need to show it to everyone. So let's do that. Okay, so we're gonna build this again. Um, but this time, uh, I've just taken the, pr the same program as before, and I've wrapped it in Julia main. So this is like the, the big change. This is the consistent theme. If you want to take your program and you want to compile it and build it, you need a Julia main. So normally, um, it's just bad style in general, right, to write a Julia program all in, as a global script. It's like slower and all these other things. Um, so normally, your, your program, like uh, this, this program, would probably all be wrapped in some kind of main-like function anyway, like do something. Um, and so this Julia main file can just be a separate file, like a really simple separate file that just calls Julia, that just defines Julia main to call your, your code. Um, but um, so the two, the two things I changed is I added this Julia main, and then for some reason that I don't fully understand right now, um, it fails if you don't fully qualify all of these exported statements. So I don't really know why. So I went through and fully qualified all of these. All right, we just have to fix it. Um, and um, it's compiling again. This time it takes two minutes because not only does it have to compile uh, to, to parse and lower your code, it has to parse and lower 
all of Blink and Plots. And so this is, what this is doing is exactly the same step that pre-compilation does the first time that you uh, import a module. But normally that's really fast because it's pre-compiled. But um, when we're building these applications, we're not building it for native, for your native machine, which is the target that pre-compilation normally targets. Um, instead, we're targeting um, just the generic, like all Intel computers if you're on a Mac, because we want to be able to send your program that you've built to any Mac, not just to your specific Mac. And so we have to redo the pre-compilation for all the packages because they haven't yet been pre-compiled for that target. They've only been pre-compiled for your target. So uh, this is really slow. Um, and because it's so slow, I'm going to move on for a second. Oh, no. What did I do? Why is it, why is it hidden? Oh, OK. I guess V just makes everything invisible. That's cool. OK. So um, last thing I want to talk about, and then this is the end of the demo time, is um, but uh, how do we make this a distributable Blink app? So even so, this thing that we built, it will work, and I'll show you in a second. Um, it's going to work, but it'll only work on my computer. And the reason it'll only work on my computer is because while this code is more or less compiled, um, it doesn't contain all of the uh, binary dependencies that Blink and Plots rely on. Um, so we have to take all of those. It, it, it's, just, it's just going to look in your .julia folder the same as it would if you ran through the REPL. So we have to take all of those dependencies these things rely on and stick them in the application so that when you send them on the App Store or wherever, um, they come along with it. Uh, so uh, to do that, we have to wrap up all the things that Blink needs. And so here is the example file for Blink on Application Builder. And it's a mess, but uh, this solves the problem. So um, there are, this is something that I'm actually hoping to talk to people about after. Um, Elliot had a talk earlier on Binary Provider, which I hope will make this problem a lot better. Right now, bin depth is part of the problem. Um, it, but um, basically, what's happening is Blink and Plots, these packages, are hard coding their paths to their binary dependencies. Um, and they do it in these variables, electron, main JS, et cetera. Um, and so we have this ugly, terrible hack right now that when we're compiling, or when we're building uh, for, with Application Builder, we set this environment variable saying, hey, we're compiling an app bundle, um, an Apple app bundle. Um, and in that case, we go through and we, after loading these packages, we eval inside of them to redefine their hard-coded paths to be relative paths so that once we actually stick these things in the application, the compiled code will be able to find them. So this is terrible, um, and it makes me sad. But uh, hopefully this is something that we can fix. I think all this should be automatable. Um, I think this should be maybe something like binary provider is, is, uh, provides a hook in the generated uh, depths.jl files to say like, hey, change this path if you need to for whatever weird reason. Or maybe we make it specifically aware of this compilation process. Like in the dumbest case, it could just also look for this and then give a different path um, in that case. But um, in any rate, for right now, you have to do something like this. And uh, the, we have a bunch of examples in here for different packages. So if you're using Blink, you just copy and paste this. If you're using GTK, you copy and paste the one for GTK. And that's just the world we live in right now. So. Um, Meantime, has this finished? Oh, did I never even run it? I don't know. It just seems to have disappeared. Okay, well, let's see if it, let's see if it, uh, it did a thing. If not, um, I have a bunch of pre-built ones. Yeah, I think it's here. So, um, okay, yeah, so this is our application. Um, it's running, we built it, it's compiled, and it does the same thing as before. And it was an application that we opened from the, from the finder, which is really cool. But it's really slow. It takes a really long time to load plots. And I think that's because it, at this point, it's like compiling all the plots for native for the first time, uh, the same as it would do in the REPL. But it's our program, and we built it, and that makes me happy. So um, Did autosnoop help at all? Uh, autosnoop would help, but it takes a really long time. And also, it doesn't work with Blink right now. Uh, it oh. like, it uh, that fails for reasons. I don't know. I added it yesterday, so I didn't really look into it too hard. But we could make it. We could make it work, and I think it it, it would it would it would eliminate that uh, big time delay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, great. So last thing is we're just putting that into our application. So it's the same as before, except we added this huge honking block um, to move all the blink resources. And I did the same for plots right here. Um, so we need to tell plots where to find its plotly. Um, and that's it. Oh, no, that's almost it. The other thing you have to do is you have to, this is that, that thing I mentioned way before. You have to tell your application at runtime to change directory back inside your application's directory um, because Apple's going to put you in your home directory. So we have a little utility for that right here. Um, and then uh, we move the global Plotly statement inside of here because we don't want this to run until after we redefine where Plotly is. And uh, we had to manually redefine the port because we don't want that to get compiled once. We want it to pick it every time. 
But that's about it. Um, and so this is going to take another two minutes to build. And while we do that, I think I'm going to take questions. But when this finishes, we're going to have a distributable, deployable application that has Julia inside of it, has blinks inside of it, has plots inside of it. And you can put it on the app store, you can put it on your website, you can put it wherever, and someone can download it, and your code will just work, which is really super exciting. Um, and um, before we, oh, before we take questions, I just want to talk about the kinds of things that we would love to see fixed. And hopefully, people here can help with that. Uh, so yeah, your application is 100 megabytes big, even though your code is like, fits in a Jupyter cell. Um, so that sucks. Um, and uh, oh, maybe it auto ran. OK, cool. Is this our program? I don't know. I don't know why this is here, but it's here. So cool. OK. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, do we, need, do we need fast Fourier transform to run Pong? Like, we don't. Um, but uh, in the 21st century, we do. In the 21st century, maybe we do, right? So um, it'd be cool if we could cut out the other libraries for the Julia runtime that we don't need. Maybe we could even cut things out of the sysimage. But I think um, partly Julia 7 will make this better because uh, the base is so much smaller. Um, but I still, I don't know. It's just like the libraries themselves are big. So um, right now, if you just like willy-nilly remove libraries, it's like faults because it can't load its libraries. So I, like short of short of recompiling Julia for every program that you run, like I don't know if the, if there are options to you know cut these things out. It's something I like to think about. Um, and uh, the other big thing is binary dependencies, like I mentioned earlier. I think uh, hopefully this week, while people are here, I'd love to talk to you and get your opinions. Um, but ideally, we can automate all that stuff so you don't even have to think about it. You just say I'm using this package, and and that's it. And that's it. I just wanted to. Thanks to these people who helped me specifically with this and this talk, and that was great. So, yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Questions? Is there a way to not include the compiler so you're absolutely sure that you have compiled everything ahead of time rather than what you discovered today? Yeah, two days ago. You right. actually just shipped all of Julia and and compiled it at the startup of the application? Um, I think that's an awesome question, and I don't know. And I actually, um, so it was, I think Jens was the name of the person who gave a talk, or two talks ago, or three talks ago, in the main room. And they were doing a lot of this ahead of time work as well. So I'm going to get his opinion, see, see if they know. But it's not something we've looked into. I don't see why you couldn't do that. I think you should be able to do that, but I haven't looked into it. Yeah. So the, uh, basically there, like, the oh, wait, hold up, sorry. That. So there would be a two-part recipe to implement that as part of this, and which is first we have a command line flag dash dash compile equals all, which will try to compile at least some version of all of your code so that it can run without the JIT present. Uh, and then the next step would be to build a version of the Julia runtime that doesn't include the LVM JIT, which is actually possible to do. Mm. And then if you put those together, it'll, it'll work. Yeah. If, you, if, you only do, if you do one but not the other, then you'll get errors that there's no compiler. So I can't, do, I can't JIT, right. sorry. But, okay. uh, but if you, if you do those two things, then that, that should be what happens. OK. So we are running with dash dash compile equals all. So maybe even the thing that I thought that I learned about Snoop and then I told you was not even true. Maybe it is compiling everything. If uh, and then so it's, it's probably com doing compile equals all. But since you're still allowing it to JIT, it's saying, oh, if I use the JIT, I can give you better uh, performance. Okay. So I'm going to compile it again. Yeah, it makes sense. I think is what's happening. Makes sense. Oh, uh, it's recompiling it to native architecture is what you're saying. Or, or for different argument types, probably. Yeah, OK, that makes sense. Uh, so what you, what you can do, though, is when you run the program, pass, pass dash dash compile equals no or, or min, mm. which will then not, will, will not then compile at runtime. Okay. That's so cool. you have to you have to do, kind of do it on both ends. You yep. have to say when I'm in the compile stage, please compile as much as possible, and then at the runtime stage, please compile as little as possible. Okay. Yeah. So, so you can because you can get any combination of, of the two. So you have to kind of tell it both times. Cool. Thanks. So yeah, we'll talk more offline. But that's the thing we're working on. It should happen. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for this dense, fast-paced talk. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to follow. Um, so, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I've, I think I've understood that you've managed to get it through the Apple Store, but JIT isn't really allowed per Apple policies. Uh, so, JIT isn't allowed for iPhones Apple Store per Apple policies. I don't think there's a problem with it in the Apple App Store for the Mac App Store. Um, but if there is, I may have like duped some people. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But my 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 understanding is that it, they don't have that restriction on the Mac App Store. Um, but okay, so that was good. obviously the second question was yeah. down the line. So that's Mac. Yeah. Um, so the the two other questions. First is, can you go mobile? Right. So no, iOS. Yeah. And and the following question is, uh, that's again Mac. How do you uh, post compile for all other architectures? You send that to a Windows 32-bit architecture, and that's an easy one. 
Mm -hmm. uh, is that going to work out of the box? How does Mac even know about that? Yeah, so, so right now we're, we're just compiling the Windows on Windows. Uh, so this application builder right now does no, no cross-compilation. It compiles for your, uh, for your operating system that you're on. It at least targets like the broader range of all targets that are Intel, but it's not um, it, no cross-compilation. Um, and uh, that's the one answer. Um, but I think like with what Elliot was talking about and things like that, like maybe we could fix this and we could cross-compile. It would be super cool. I've never even thought about that before half an hour ago, so that'd be cool. Uh, and then for mobile, the answer is um, exactly like you said. Well, first of all, I don't think Julia builds on mobile yet. Um, there have been some attempts that I've looked at, but nothing too much. Um, but uh, second is, yeah, you have this big restriction. You can't do jitting at, at runtime. So we'd have, to, we'd have to fix, we'd have to make sure there's, that it all works uh, statically. But there are a lot of people thinking about that. And I think, I think with, if this was something people were working on hard, I think within months that should be possible. Um, yeah. Um, I'm thinking if we want to do totally AOT compilation, then what about those types can't be decided ahead of time? Uh, do we have to specify the type for each variable? Uh, because some of the types can only be decided dynamically. Yeah, so while, you, while, while we pass the mic, go ahead though, yeah. But I was gonna say, I think that's some of what's cool about having the like almost all ahead of time compiled, right? So that's like I, I, in, the, in the Mac version now, it's like almost all ahead of time, but the JIT is still there. So if it needs to, it can do things, which is cool. But what were you gonna say? Yeah, so currently what will happen is you will get some fraction of your program compiled to good code that's not easy to predict. Uh, so I think we're going to need some better tooling to help, uh, to help with that process. Uh, but in the meantime, the, what usually helps is to put uh, types on arguments, uh, put as specific types as possible on function arguments. Uh, and then the, the more you do that, the, the better it will work out. But uh, yeah, I think, I think we'll need some, some tooling to help, you know, sort of show you what things might need types, uh, show you where we're having trouble compiling things statically. That's future work. Great, we've got uh, time for another question. Okay, perfect, let's thank Nathan again.